This imminent movement proclaims the absolute being as spirit. Absolute being that is not grasped as spirit is merely the abstract void, just as spirit that is not grasped as this movement is only an empty word. When its moments are grasped in their purity, they are the restless notions which only are in being in themselves their own opposite and in finding their rest in the whole. But the picture thinking of the religious community is not this speculative thinking. It has the content, but without its necessity. And instead of the, the form of the notion, it brings into the realm of pure consciousness the natural relationships of father and son. Since this consciousness, even in its thinking, remains at the level of picture thinking, absolute being is indeed revealed to it. But the moments of this being, on account of all this empirically synthetic presentation, partly themselves fall asunder so that they are not related to one another through their own notion, and partly this consciousness retreats from this its pure object, relating itself to it only in an external manner. The object is revealed to it by something alien, and it does not recognize itself in this thought of spirit, does not recognize the nature of pure self-consciousness. Insofar as the form of picture thinking and of those relationships derived from nature must be transcended, and especially also the standpoint which takes the moments of the movement, which spirit is as isolated immovable substances or subjects, instead of transient moments, the transcending of this standpoint is to be regarded as a compulsion on the part of the notion, as we pointed out earlier, in connection with another aspect. But since this compulsion is an instinctive, self-consciousness misunderstands its own nature, rejects the content as well as the form and what amounts to the same thing, degrades the content into historical, pictorial idea and to an heirloom handed down by tradition. In this way, it is only the purely external element in belief that is retained and as something therefore that is dead and cannot be known. But the inner element in faith has vanished because this would be the notion that knows itself as notion. Paragraph 771 is getting a little bit more concrete, although there's still a lot of abstraction here, of course, but you start to get a better picture of where the preceding paragraphs we're going, you know, Hegel loves this notion of a circular movement and seeing everything in the totality. And that is indeed the way that that spirit and the, let's call it the most adequate self-understanding of spirit through concept or notion, begriff, takes place. And religion by its very nature is not all that conceptual in Hegel's sense and much more rooted in lower forms of cognition that are not able to grasp themselves entirely as such lower forms. And Vorstellung, which we've been talking about throughout this entire section, really throughout the entire religion section, is, is, is the determinate way in which this takes place. And we're talking here about the Vorstellung or the picture thinking representation, pictorial presentation is another translation that's being used here of the religious community, the, the Gemeine. Um, so this is, um, you know, a, a very important paragraph for developing a, let's call it dilemma that has to be faced, a fork in the road where inadequacy is realized and spirits or the you know religious person or the community can go one way or can go the other or can you know it's maybe a trilemma it can remain in place and that's what we see taking place here on the part of consciousness or self-consciousness uh, it's either going to remain rooted in picture thinking or it's going to descend to something even lesser than picture thinking or it's going to ascend to the notion. And obviously, which, which are we supposed to choose? Which, is, which way is religion supposed to go? It's supposed to go for the notion. And in this case, Hegel says some very interesting things. We not only have the 
notion. We have absolute being as spirit and its, its moments are notions. So that's one side. We also at the very end have the notion that knows itself as notion. We could call it notion squared if you want to. Although it, you know, this is part of what it means to be notional or conceptual, conceptual, right? Is that there is a grasping of one's own involvement in the very activity that's going on. It's not just treating everything as a object, a Gegenstand, but it, there's a totality that includes the knower, right? So all that said, let's see what Hegel's actually saying in the text. He begins by saying this imminent movement. What's the imminent movement? Well, what we just talked about in paragraphs 769 and 770, right? In 770, he said there's three distinct moments, essence and two kinds of being for self. And all of these are the three moments uh, that are involved in this kaizenda uh, uh, bewegung, this circular movement, right? So this imminent movement that we're talking about here proclaims Absolute being, Wesen, as spirit, Geist. What we've been charting out the entire time. What we're working with, right? Geist is sort of, you know, not the raw material as such, but the raw material and the shaper and the knower, and we could keep going on and on and on. I mean, this is the phenomenology of, of Geist, of spirit. So what does this mean? Harry says two really interesting things that we're probably going to have to come back to a little bit later. Absolute being that is not grasped as, right? And then spirit that is not grasped as, and there, there's, you know, one of these is in as this movement, right? And if you're not grasping, if you're not conceptualizing these two things, absolute being and spirit, they cease being what they are. Why? Well, absolute being that is not grasped as spirit, so it's grasped in another way, is merely the abstract void, lera, right? An emptiness, um, something that we think is going to provide us with plentitude and explanations and a satisfaction, and it turns out not to do so. And this is what happened in the unhappy consciousness. And this is also, you could say, what happened in the um, faith and, and insight section as well. And this is what's happening in previous forms of consciousness that are also religious. If we're not grasping absolute being, the, the God, the deity, the divinity, as spirit in this sort of complex, uh, interconnected way, well, then we're going to sooner or later exhaust the resources of that point of view. And we may not realize that in any one given author or ritual or community or generation, but sooner or later people will come to see the inadequacies of that, that perspective, right? What about spirit? This is very interesting. And this should give a lot of people pause. When you talk about Hegel, if you don't actually know what the hell you're talking about, if you haven't done the work of traversing this long path of spirit in the phenomenology, Hegel would say, if, you, if you're taking shortcuts, you, you're not really talking about spirit anymore. You're reducing spirit to a linguistic expression so how does he say this? He says, spirit not grasped with this movement is only an empty word. Now, he's just talked about the word in several paragraphs earlier. So if we're thinking about this in terms of like, well, Jesus Christ is spirit in Christianity. If you don't really think these things through all the way, Hegel's saying, you're just playing around with empty signifiers. It's fun to do. You can hang out with all your you know, friends, whether online or in Hegel groups or something like that, and chitter chatter about this sort of thing. But you're not really getting what he's saying. And you know, uh, this is a bit of a uh, 
Let's call this a rant on my part, right? A lot of people read the phenomenology and they, you know, they read the preface. They usually skip over the introduction because the preface is so much cooler and they, you know, get through the, the consciousness section and they're mostly interested in, you know, uh, the very first part of it and the very end part of it, right? So they're interested in the sense perception, right? And, and, uh, the consciousness of that. Um, and then they're interested in the, you know, force and the understanding and they don't spend the time to actually understand it. Then they want to get to the, the really cool stuff, the master slave dialectic, which means reading the, you know, the first part, the truth of self certainty. And then they kind of, you know, skim through the stoicism, skepticism, unhappy consciousness, even though that's bigger. And then they get to the, the, you know, the reason section and the spirit section, which are the biggest parts of the book, right? That's the bulk of the phenomenology. And they, you know, they touch here and there on things. Well, you know, we should talk about the beautiful soul in the spirit section. And we definitely should talk about the phrenology and physiognomy section because it's got that cool quote, spirit is a bone, which Hegel is saying, spirit is not a bone. <laughs> you should punch people out who actually think that. But they, they miss all that. And then they get to this, this section and they're talking about spirit. And Hegel would say, you, you don't know what you're talking about because you haven't done the rigorous work of getting through all of this stuff. All right, rant over, caution over. Uh, let's, let's jump into the, what he says here. So he says, when its moments are grasped in their purity, what's moments? Absolute being a spirit. They are restless notions which only are, and here we get the typical Hegelian thing, right? Being in their, the, themselves, their own opposite. That's, you know, okay, that's typical Hegel. Things generate their own opposition. But he says, finding their rest, the Ruah, in, in the whole, in the totality, the totality, right? The Gansheit, right? So this is important. These, these moments, these notions, they are connected with each other, and they find their meaning, their, their total meaning, in a whole that they comprise. And that whole includes us. If we're religious believers, it includes us, it includes the community, right? And it includes this entire process. So he goes on and he says, The picture thinking of the religious community is not this speculative thinking. It is thinking, it is Denkin, right? So we have thinking at all three of these levels, but the thinking is thinking is happening in terms of this speculative perspective, this, you know, perspective that takes in all of what's, what's happening here, including the failed approaches as well and understands why these are failing approaches. So what is the picture thinking of the religious community? So he says, it has the content without its necessity. We're going to come back to that. And instead of the form of the notion, the concept, the begriff, it brings into the realm of pure consciousness the natural relationships, right? The natural interconnections, the being related to each other of father and son. A little bit later, um, the way it'll be translated is these are relationships derived from nature. We'll talk about that in, in just a moment. To what degree are they really, truly derived from nature or do they involve culture, humanity in a certain way as well? But the, the key thing here is that consciousness, the consciousness of the religious community, which is also self-consciousness, is grasping the absolute being of spirit through the, these models, these images of natural relationships. And that is what Hegel calls picture thinking, Vorstellung. Um, he's also going to call this uh, a synthetic presentation. Presentation translated here by Miller is just Vorstellung. So a you know, synthesische Vorstellung uh, it's, it's still picture thinking, uh, presentation, collective imagination, however you want to understand it. And notice the word synthetic here. So if, again, you know, I've said this so many times, Hegel is not about uh, thesis, 
antithesis, greater synthesis. Here, something being synthetic is actually a sign of it not being the final thing. Synthetic here could be opposed to conceptual, begreifliche, right? Or begreifendes. Um, so, but it's also opposed to this, this sort of rejection of content and form that's going to take place in just a moment as well. So he, he says, it remains at the level of picture thinking. Absolute being is indeed revealed to it. We, we have revealed religion, right? Offenbarung. It's revealed to it, but the moments of this being, on account of this synthetic presentation, partly themselves fall asunder, so they're not related to one another. Now, they are related to one another because we have a relationship here, right? <laughs> but they're not related to each other. How are they not related to each other? Through the concept. They are related to each other through picture thinking, which does place them as if they are separate things, immovable uh, substances or subjects. So the you know, I mean, we can talk about the Trinity and, and, you know, how complex that is, all we want. And, you know, the Father is not the Son, but the, the, both of them are God, right? Uh, and then we bring in the Holy Spirit to make it even more complicated. But just, just think Father and Son for a while. And also think to yourself, you know, uh, is Hegel on the right track here? I mean, if you think about some of the conceptual problems that early Christians got into and then got into arguments about and then split into different communities about. Think about the Arians, right? The Arians, uh, you know, father, son, uh, they can't really be equal. What's this Jesus guy about? He is, he's the son in a metaphorical sense. You know, he's a really awesome guy and teacher and stuff like that, but he's not begotten by the father, you know. Um, that would be you know, sort of a rejection of natural relationship is adequate. It's not yet conceptual in Arianism. It's actually closer to this, you could call it falling away or bad alternative for self-consciousness, the self-consciousness of the community. And we could go on and on with other interesting examples. So let's come back to this, right? Um, and actually let's pause on this for a moment before we start talking about, you know, this external manner and all that. Is the relationship between father and son a relationship purely of nature, or is there, in fact, cultural components to it, experiential components? I'm reminded of a guy who I knew when I was working at Indiana State Prison and teaching in a religious studies classes, and he was teaching for a different college. I was teaching for Ball State University. He was teaching for Grace College. And we we're having lunch and he was talking about fatherhood and the difficulty in talking about God as the father if your father was a complete a-hole, you know, as was the case for many of these guys in lockup. Um, you know, they would see that and they'd be like, well, why would I want to relate myself to somebody who abused me, who abandoned me, who exploited me, who did all these terrible things, not just to me, but also to my siblings and to my mother, you know, why would I, why would I want to conceive God in that way? Or if God is that way, then I guess God is a big jerk as well. You know, that's not a natural relationship or natural understanding of fatherhood, that is something that's coming from experience. That's something that's also enracinated in culture. How should a father be? This varies from culture to culture to culture. What are the duties incumbent upon a son? How does generationality and inheritance work? These are not purely natural relations, right? So and what am I saying here? Is Hegel wrong? Is he playing fast and loose with you? No, no. Um, but these are, these are um, pictured or imagined or represented relations, are they not? And this, this is, there's another really interesting implication here that Hegel doesn't draw out. What if we reconceptualize God? What if we say, oh, God's not a father, God's a mother? And we, you know, regender the parent, and, you know, the, the mother and the daughter. Let's make it like that. Or, you know, God is non-binary. Um, we're still working in the realm of representation here. 
we're still working with, if not you know, purely natural relationships, certainly conditioned cultural relationships that are probably not adequate to what the divinity is. So we don't get out of it just by saying, oh, we'll get, we'll get past father and son. That's the, the big problem there. I mean, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, you want to see a great Christian thinker who conceptualizes God both as father and as mother and discusses this, look at St. Anselm, you know. Uh, read the Monologion, read some of his letters, read other places where he's talking about this, his prayers and meditations where he uh, effectively regenders, you know, St. Paul as a mother, you know. Uh, so, you know, we go on and on with this. So let's come back to the Hegel at this point. So he says... They're not related to one another through their own notion, and this consciousness retreats from this its pure object, relating itself to it only in an external manner. This is you know, foreshadowing the descent, the fall, we could say. He says, the, sp the object is revealed to it by something alien, and it does not recognize itself in this thought of spirit. So it's missing things on two sides, right? The object is revealed to it by something alien, which is picture thinking. Uh, an externalization, a descent into otherness, as we've seen in previous paragraphs. And that obscures the object itself, and it obscures consciousness or self-consciousness's own involvement in this. It doesn't see a place for itself in the Father and the Son, right? So what happens then? He says, insofar as the form of picture thinking and of those relationships derived from nature must be transcended, right? We have to go up, right? Uh, we have to go outside of this. And especially also the standpoint, which takes the moments of the movement, which spirit is, as isolated immovable substances or subjects, instead of correctly seeing them as transient moments, the transcending of this standpoint is to be regarded as a compulsion on the part of the notion. Now, isn't that an interesting way to talk about it? And Hegel tells us, um, I've you know, pointed this out earlier in connection with another aspect. Yes, but he didn't use the same term, compulsion, drangen, right? A drive. Uh, this is part of the notion itself, the notion as alive, the notion as sentient, the notion as involving us, taking us along for the ride and saying, come on, we got to go over here and do something. And what do we do with it? What does the religious community, what does the religious believer do with it? Well, they either ascend or they descend and they screw things up, right? And then they can oscillate between this picture thinking and, and even more ineffective, inadequate, historical, uh, pictorial idea, which is another kind of picture thinking, right? So what he says is, uh, this is a compulsion on the part of the notion, but since this compulsion is instinctive, and he uses the word instinct there, right? Um, this compulsion isn't really adequately self-conscious or conscious of the demands of its object, it's forgotten things along the way, what happens? Well, there's a rejection of both the form and the content, right? The form is inadequate, but it doesn't reject the form of picture thinking altogether. It generates a new kind of picture thinking. And this is interesting, because what is Hegel targeting here? Well, uh, two things, right? Two things that we would have a tendency to blur together but he's actually got two different targets in mind. Well, let's read what the text says, and then we'll, we'll you know, talk about the diagram a little bit more. So, um, self-consciousness misunderstands its own nature and rejects the content as well as the form, and what amounts to the same thing, degrades the content. So it's, it's rejecting the form, but still using the form. It degrades the content to two things, a historical pictorial idea, which is a Vorstellung, but now it's a Geschichtliche Vorstellung. And remember back in the previous paragraphs where what is it that the um, picture thinking actually comes to, you know, realize itself, realize is going on in here? The, a happening, Geschehen, right? 
Geschehen and Geschicht are connected with each other. So, you know, Geschichtliche, what, is, what, are, what are the happenings, right? A historical pictorial idea. Hegel is actually, I think, here criticizing some of the higher criticism, the higher biblical criticism that is taking aim at the, the revelation and the way that the revelation has been typically understood by the community and saying, well, you know, you can't actually trust all these gospel narratives. You know, we need to uh, reconsider this part and this part. And, you know, you cut out enough stuff and, and you really don't have much of a story at all, right? Or it's an heirloom handed down by tradition. Erbstücke der Tradition, right? And what is, why, why is uh, Miller saying handed down by tradition? Because tradition itself means handing down. That is what it is, traditio, right? And so we could easily lose this as English speakers. The very current of tradition is a handing of things down from generation to generation. So we have the dry, historical, desiccated, external idea, or we have something that's being handed down by tradition rather uncritically, rather blindly. None of these are a great alternative to the picture thinking that's already going on here, right? None of these are a transcending, although they may purport to be a transcending. So What's the transcending that we're supposed to be aiming at? Well, he tells us, right? Um, there we go. Well, I mean, let's go back to the, the start, right? Absolute being as spirit and grasping the restless notions, which are in being themselves their own opposite, finding their rest in the whole. That's where we're supposed to be going. And if you look at the very end of this, um, you know, the notion that knows itself as notion, which would be is what we're aiming at, right? The inner element in faith uh, disappearing that way. So he goes on and he says, um, in this way, only the purely external element in belief is retained, something that is dead and cannot be known. The inner element in faith has vanished. Where would we get the inner element in faith? By grasping the religious object and ourselves as spirit, as together, through the notion, through the notion that knows itself as notion, which is where we're, we're going in the following paragraphs, which is what we're aiming for this entire time. We don't yet have it completely, right? But we're, we're getting further. We're, and we're not totally leaving this other stuff behind as, you know, this is just rejected crap, you know. We're not pulling the ladder up with us this all still matters, and, and actually generationally, people will probably need to pass through this every generation if what Hegel is viewing as the consummate religion is, is to continue on. But for Hegel, for Hegel, and this is his vision of Christianity, we need to move to this. We can't rely just on picture thinking any more than we can on historical picture thinking or a tradition that would be handing, you know, essentially picture thinkings on that people have actually lost the, the meaning of over time. And notice that this is also, here's where I want to wrap up, also a compulsion. You know, Hegel talked about the uh, compulsion of, uh, of spirit, right? or the compulsion of the notion, the dangin, it can go one of two ways. And in a certain respect, we can say we have a choice about where we're going. In the phenomenology, obviously, Hegel's telling us, go here, don't go here, because other people are already going here, and that's a dead end. So we're going to follow out where he's going in taking the path of the notion or the concept.